Un cordiale benvenuto a ciascuno, ai, ai colleghi, agli amici, agli studenti tutti, al, vice -rettore, al delegato del vice rettore accademico, al nostro relatore e, e naturalmente al nostro grandissimo animatore dell'incontro che è il professor Jerry Willan. Bene, siamo qui tutti per il Fort Annual Lonergan Lecture. E abbiamo il piacere di avere con noi il professor dottor Randall Rosenberg della St. Louis University. E il mio compito è limitatissimo, considerati anche i tempi molto, molto ristretti, e da questo punto di vista quindi non posso far altro che eh, passare subito la parola al delegato del vice rettore accademico della Pontificia Università Gregoriana, padre Mark Davis. Prego. Buonasera a tutti. Anzitutto vorrei dare il benvenuto in nome dell'Università Pontificia Gregoriana a tutti voi, but it's also my great pleasure to welcome all of you, but especially Professor Randall Rosenberg of St. Louis University to this fourth annual Lonergan Lecture. He will give a lecture entitled this evening, The Desire to See God, Natural or Supernatural? Professor Rosenberg is married and he, has, and he and his wife have two children, a boy and a girl. He is considered one of the most accomplished of a younger generation of Lonergan scholars emerging in the US today. His recently published book, The Givenness of Desire, Concrete Subjectivity and the Natural Desire to See God, has established his reputation as a scholar of note amongst a variety of theological audiences including Thomist scholars, theologians of Christian anthropology, and scholars of spiritual theology. I myself, as an alumnus of St. Louis University, a Billiken, um, gives me particular pleasure to welcome Professor Rosenberg, who teaches at St. Louis University. When I was there in the early 1980s and studying philosophy, the Jesuit scholastics in a seminar on medieval philosophy were asked if there were any Jesuits of the 20th century that merited or, or had the reputation of some of the medieval or 16th century Jesuits. I hazard, hazarded the guess that Bernard Lonergan might be among that number and was met with some skepticism at St. Louis University. But the intervening years, I think, have made this more clear, the importance of Bernard Lonergan. When I went to theology in Toronto in the late 1980s, the Lonergan Center there was already beginning to establish Lonergan as a major person of thought in the 20th century. The continued interest and even growth of Lonergan studies leaves me to say a word about the Lonergan project here in the university. If you look at the webpage of the theology faculty, you will find a window called the Lonergan Project. The idea for this Lonergan project emerged eight years ago in 2010 when Father Francis Xavier Dumortier was rector of the university. He invited Father Jerry Whalen of our Department of Fundamental Theology, who had studied the thought of Lonergan for his doctorate, to help create what he called a little school of Lonergan within the university. Eight years on, this little school clearly exists, and for this I thank Father Whalen for his dedication to and enthusiasm for this project. In addition to this annual Lonergan lecture, we have as well a Lonergan club here at the university, which meets monthly, and about which I understand someone else will have a word. Similarly, we offer opportunities for doctoral students at the university to consider using a Lonergan method as a base for whatever topic they are studying. For these last two years, our little school of Lonergan has enjoyed the support of our current rector, Father Nuno Gonsalves, and I present his apologies this evening for not being able to be here tonight because of an alternative commitment. So finally, I would like to return to welcoming Professor Rosenberg. Once again, we thank you for being here with us and helping us to launch our year-long set of Lonergan activities. May the God of our desires, both natural and supernatural, Bless you, your family, and the important work that you do. 
Eh, molte grazie padre Mark Levis per questo saluto personale e al tempo stesso incoraggiante e ben introduttivo anche dei lavori di questo pomeriggio. Bene, eh, allora adesso grazie anche a padre Gerry che è sempre molto prodigo di eh, sollecitazioni e inviti soprattutto quando riguarda il Loner Gun Club e eh, ci fa arrivare qualche invito particolare attraverso lui o qualche altra persona che ha delegato. Prego. Ecco, sono partecipanti dell'Honor Gun Club e, e così sono anche protagonisti di questa esperienza che si sta tenendo ormai da, da vari anni nella nostra università gregoriana a cui possono partecipare tutti coloro che sono effettivamente interessati anche al pensiero di Loner e a confrontarsi comunque anche con altre persone su questo ricchissimo pensiero. Prego. Grazie. Buonasera. Um, sono Stanley, un studente del primo ciclo, terzo anno, uh, anche un membro del Lonergan Club da due anni. E vorrei invitarvi a coloro che hanno un interesse nel pensiero o opere di Bernard Lonergan di, di andare alla nostra uh, raduno del, che svolgere ogni mese. Il primo è tra due settimane, il 20, 21 di novembre. E questo non soltanto per, per quelli che hanno interesse, ma anche per quelli che vorrebbero saperne di più sui uh, opere o pensieri di Bernard Lonergan. Quindi è una cordiale invitazione alla nostra club che eh, cominciamo uh, fra poco. Grazie. Buonasera a tutti. La mia presenza qui è solo per fare una sorta di promozione, perché la presenza del Honor Gun Club è abbastanza silenziosa, ma anche abbastanza attiva all'interno della Gregoriana. Tant'è vero che nella, nella home page dell'università, dell in modo particolare nella pagina della teologia, troverete appunto una piccola casella con il nostro progetto Lonerga. Si tratta di un progetto che è ancora in fase di evoluzione, tant'è vero che le informazioni che vi troverete sono ancora essenziali, però eh, il, la pagina è in fase di costruzione, quindi nelle prossime settimane troverete maggiori informazioni e maggiori aggiornamenti. Altro dato importante è l'evento che si è celebrato questa mattina eh, grazie alla presenza del professor Rosenberg ed è un colloquio dottorale. Eh, il desiderio appunto è quello di eh, non celebrare i colloqui dottorali una volta all'anno nell'occasione appunto delle nostre conferenze annuali ma di fare di questo evento un processo continuativo in cui i dottorandi di tutte eh, eh, le facoltà dell'Università Gregoriana possono confrontarsi sul metodo in teologia e sul modo in cui applicare il metodo nella stesura delle loro dissertazioni dottorali e nei vari ambiti disciplinari a cui essi afferiscono. Io auguro a tutti un buon lavoro e una buona serata. C'è qualche altra cosa? Ecco, eh, non so, adesso Gerry vuoi presentare il nostro relatore? Intanto rientriamo ancora nei minuti proprio precedenti alla, ai nostri lavori, un, visto che le informazioni varie anche sui luoghi di studio di Lonergan sono state date, eh, padre Willan mi consentirà di dare soltanto un'informazione che ormai si è costituita in Italia una società italiana di studi lonerganiani denominata SIS LON, e potrete attraverso internet trovare anche i vari riferimenti o poi indicarmi quando volete anche qualche vostro desiderio a riguardo. Passo subito la parola al professor Jerry Willan. Prego. Molte grazie professoressa Finamore. È una parola di ringraziamento alla professoressa eh, che è una professoressa ordinaria emerita della Facoltà di Filosofia 
è una grande perdita di non averla a tempo pieno perché eh, insegnava Lonergan nella facoltà di, di filosofia per molti anni, quindi grazie. E tanti auguri su, su quel, quel sviluppo a livello de, de, eh, nazionale eh, in Italia, di questa associazione italiana di, di Lonergan, quindi grazie per il servizio al movimento, insomma. Um, due parole su quelle pubblicità. Ecco, ho sentito un, una dietro di me che è stata così interessata, ha, interessata, ha detto già a che ora, e quindi fra due mercoledì, eh, è, è 21 eh, di, di, di novembre, alle 5, cioè alle 17, per un'ora, un po' di più eh, si vuole, se si vuole, eh, l'aula è C204 accanto della facoltà di teologia c'è un, un, un bar, un piccolo, un piccolo, una piccola stanza. Però meglio che ci date il vostro nome e indirizzo di email. Quindi ci sono due elenchi qui, pagine quando uscite. Una per il Lonergan Club, l'altro per studenti dottorali che sarebbero interessati nel, in, un, in un incontro in seguito di quel incontro con la facoltà di teologia questa mattina. Però per ogni facoltà nel futuro eh, eh, questo incontro per studenti dottorali eh, si terrà. Grazie. Allora, um, avete già sentito un po' l'introduzione al eh, professore eh, Rosenberg. È, è, è vero ciò che ha detto eh, il, il delegato del vicerettore accademico, che eh, è fra i primi in una fra una nuova generazione di, di professori eh, di Lonergan. Eh, ci sono molti che con tutto rispetto hanno l'età di 75 eh, adesso, che hanno conosciuto Lonergan per caso, ma c'è un tipo di transizione adesso e, e fra i primi c'è il eh, professore eh, Rosenberg. Eh, so Randall, professor Rosenberg is an associate professor of systematic theology at St. Louis University. He received his PhD in Systematic Theology from Boston College. He teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in St. Louis University. He's the author of the book, The Givenness of Desire, as you've already heard, Concrete Subjectivity and the Natural Desire to See God, University of Toronto Press. It is on sale, there's one copy of the hardback on sale, but you're, there's another list outside that the library, uh, that the book Um, the libreria, uh, uh, the bookstore here, has a table for presentation of books on Lonergan. Um, the the, the um, cartaccia, uh, the, um, the paperback copy of the book of Professor Rosenberg will arrive in about two weeks in, in the bookstore. So if you don't want to pay your money for the hard copy, um, you could sign up already now with the bookstore for, for the, uh, the paperback. The, um, Dr. Rosenberg also edited, uh, the, uh, along with another author, the essays of Frederick Lawrence, The Fragility of Consciousness, Faith, Reason, and the Human Good. And Professor Lawrence, who is of that age I was mentioning, was our um, uh, annual Lonergan lecturer two years ago. Professor Rosenberg also writes a theology column in a publication for the Archdiocese of St. Louis, Catholic St. Louis, and is very pastorally engaged in his parish and diocese. He is currently working on a book that draws on the work of Lonergan to develop a sapiential vision of philosophy and theology, and does so in conversation with the work of Pierre Hadot and Hadot's emphasis on philosophy as a way of life. So I won't go on, uh, but this is his list of publications. That, uh, the, so he has much published, many articles. Uh, the, he is a, a significantly one of the editors of the, the key journal of Lonergan Studies, Method. So with that inadequate introduction, I hand over la parola to um, Dr. Rosenberg. Thank you. Good evening. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you to uh, Father Jerry Whalen for the uh, hospitality. Uh, so far on this trip, and uh, just very grateful uh, to be here in Rome, and thank you for the introductions and the hospitality of the entire uh, university community. 
I prepared for uh, this trip to Rome by eating pasta and pizza for a whole week uh, ahead of time. So I am very excited uh, to be here. And I would also say, uh, if I see your eyes closing during the talk, uh, I'll assume you're meditating on supernatural and natural desires on this Friday evening. So thank you for being here. It's a real honor. De Lubach Sur Natural was an intentional body blow to the neo-scholastic understandings of reason and grace, as well as to neo-scholastic conception of philosophy and theology and the relation between them. Its publication constituted a cultural event nearly as important as Martin Heidegger's Being in Time or Wittgenstein's Philosophical Investigations. Beginning with Sir Naturel, along with a modified essay, The Mystery of the Supernatural, published shortly thereafter in the same year, and continuing with The Mystery of the Supernatural, the book, uh, and Augustinianism and Modern Theology, Henri de Lubac sought to refute the doctrine of pure nature as developed by the 16th and 17th century neo-scholastic commentators. It certainly seemed that in the clash between neo-scholasticism and Ressourcement, uh, the, the Ressourcement theology that followed de Lubac, the latter had decisively won. One might say that in light of the Second Vatican Council and the pontificates that emerged thereafter, that neo-scholasticism, whose obituary had been written, or uh, pardon me, that, that this neo-Thomism of the Roman universities, Garagou Lagrange, Charles Boyer, uh, was relegated to the dustbins of history. But as Edward Oakes, the late Edward Oakes, had noted a few years ago, this same neo-scholasticism, whose obituary has been written so many times, has now shown surprising signs of life. A generation removed from Vatican II, certain scholars have investigated the work of Henri de Lubac and have questioned whether he misrepresented the Thomas tradition, an uncritical, an uncritical embrace of the developments associated with Ressourcement has even, some suggest, contributed to the decline of vocations, religious apathy, secularism, and the widespread dismissal of the church's moral claims. Did not de Lubac's integration of nature and grace tend to collapse the two together, inscribing grace into nature? And did not the supernaturalizing of the natural diminish both the integrity of nature on the one hand and the surprising unmerited gift of grace on the other hand? The aim of this lecture is to contribute in some ways, I realize I'm entering into a long uh, conversation with, with a deep history, but to contribute in some modest way to this conversation. Is the human desire for God natural or supernatural? In order to address the question, I proceed as follows. First, I present the systematic proposal of one example of this neo-scholastic res uh, re resurgence, namely, Lawrence Feingold's The Natural Desire to See God According to St. Thomas and His Interpreters. Second, in light of Feingold's challenges, I draw on resources from the thought of Lonergan, and some of his contemporary interpreters to address two, the natural, desire, the natural desire for God, and three, the supernatural desire for God. Finally, building on the categories developed in part three and mindful of the ressourcement emphasis on the saints, I reflect on the lives of Therese of Lisieux and Eddie Hillison as examples of women who manifested a desire for God in history. Feingold's challenge, and Feingold actually is a theologian who uh, lives in St. Louis, about three miles uh, from me. He teaches at our uh, local seminary, Kenrick Seminary. Lawrence Feingold's exhaustive study stands at the heart of the reemergence mentioned above. Indeed, Feingold offers a thorough, though of course debatable, analysis of key texts from Aquinas and the history of his interpreters. And with his re-examination of the centuries-old conversation, he not only critiques de Lubac, but also challenges a narrative taken for granted, and then himself attempts to retell the story. Feingold directly addresses the Thomas commentarial tradition that was so vehemently uh, critiqued by de Lubac. Feingold understands his own retrieval of the scholastic thing thinkers in a similar way that de Lubac understands his retrieval of the fathers as a work of love 
right, as a work of love, and not as a retrieval of paleotomism, uh, as somebody like John Milbank uh, has suggested. With the limited scope of this lecture in mind, I emphasize Feingold's systematic theological proposal. A brief word, however, on his pastoral concern. Feingold believes that the classical Thomist school chastised by de Lubac bears the elements of a solution that, that reaches a fine balance, that reaches a fine balance between the natural desire for the vision of God and the distinction of the natural and supernatural orders. Feingold suggests, for example, that one of the pastoral challenges of our time is that so many want to take heaven for granted. Heaven is due, many contend, in popular consciousness, to our natural goodness as human beings. This naturalization of heaven demands a rekindling, he says, of the radical wonder at the inconceivable dimension of the gift of our supernatural vocation. De Lubach's natural desire for the supernatural lends itself to exac exacerbating this pastoral challenge. The fact that human beings are not intrinsically ordered by nature to the vision of God, but only by grace, better manifests the humility of the spiritual creature, whose nature is coherent and conceivable without the gift of the supernatural, to which it nevertheless stands uniquely open, and which alone will give it an absolutely perfect beatitude. At the end of his work, Feingold proposes a framework for understanding the human desire to see God. These four states of the desire for God offer the resources, he says, for more adequately analyzing the relation between nature and grace, and focus on the transformation of this desire from the natural to the supernatural plane. The following constitute, in summary, uh, the four states of the human desire for God. This might make your head a little dizzy, uh, all these terms here, but we shall see. First, for Feingold, we possess an innate desire for our co-natural end, that is, to know and love God through the mirror of creation. For Feingold, this follows from the very nature of our spiritual faculties. This is not an act, but simply the relation of the spiritual faculties to their proportionate end. This desire is innate, and he says, unconscious. Second, I'm on the second desire here. St. Thomas, according to Feingold, demonstrates the existence of a naturally elicited desire for the vision of God's essence. Feingold infers that this desire is conditional without the aid of revelation and actual grace. The object of this natural desire is simple, simply essential knowledge of the first cause. This requires prior knowledge of the existence of God, hence the desire is elicited in conscience, conscious. Sorry. So uh, once we have a knowledge of the existence of God, then a desire is elicited to, to know God. Third, the elicited and conditional desire just described is transformed into an unconditional desire for the vision of God through knowledge of God's promise and revelation, together with the aid of actual grace. This desire reveals an act of theological hope that pre presupposes the reality of faith. The object of this desire is seeing the Trinitarian God face to face. The resulting acts of hope and charity lead us to seek baptism by which we receive an abiding inclination directly for the vision of God through the gift of sanctifying grace. Finally, the fourth state is the supernatural habitual inclination for the vision of God that results from sanctifying grace. This state consists of the theological virtues of hope and charity. This habitual inclination is present Whenever a soul is in the state of grace, it is independent of knowledge and thus unconditional and is based on the proportionality, Feingold says, between grace and glory. Right? So what he says, the kind of four steps, if you like, uh, of the human desire for God. There is much to engage here. For now, it is pertinent to capture the heart of Feingold's claim. The natural desire to see God is not sufficient to order us to our supernatural end. This requires the virtue of charity, which flows from sanctifying grace, both supernatural realities that make us partakers in the divine nature. In short, Feingold's challenge is to work out systematically the relationship between, as I say, the natural desire to see God, the habit of charity, and sanctifying grace. Lonergan on the natural desire to see God. 
I now retrieve key aspects of Lonergan's thought, mindful on the one hand of the Lubachians, uh, the, the followers of De Lubach, their legitimate concern with the concrete and the historical, and on the other hand, of the call of many Thomas to affirm a more substantive account of nature. In light of the eros of the mind of the concrete subject, Lonergan's account of nature in scholastic terms, and in his more dynamic and scientifically influenced account of emergent probability, respond to both of these challenges. Nature, after all, doesn't come to grace, first with deficiency, but as plenitude. And I take that idea from uh, the Dominican, the Toulouse Dominican, uh, Gilbert Narcisse. Lonergan roots his position in the dynamism of the human mind and the natural desire to know, which I discuss at chapter three uh, at length in my book. For Lonergan, the human desire to know is natural insofar as the desires of the intellect are manifested in questions for meaning and truth and value. Although its natural fulfillment is limited by a proportionate object, our desire to know, he uses the language, is transcendent. It is unlimited and hence wants to know everything about everything, ultimately being itself. When we affirm that God exists through our natural knowledge of God, we seek to understand this affirmation with the question, what is God? In this sense, we have a natural desire to know God. Still, the best that natural reason can attain, according to Lonergan, is the discovery of the paradox, that the desire to understand arises naturally, that its object is the transcendental ends, and that the proper fulfillment that naturally is attainable is restricted to the proportionate object of the intellect. This natural desire includes God and can only be fulfilled supernaturally in the beatific vision. In sum, I highlight three consonances between Feingold, or Lonergan and Feingold. First, Lonergan's accent on the pure desire to know corresponds in some ways to Feingold's first state, the innate ontological incl inclination to know the causes of things and by extension to know and love God in the mirror of creation. Second, Lonergan's argument about once we know that God, God exists, we ask the, the question is elicited, what is God? And that question is based on our knowledge of God's existence, corresponding to Feingold's second state, the naturally elicited desire to see God. Third, Lonergan's uh, accent on the paradox and disproportionate fulfillment correspond to Feingold's emphasis that the beatific vision exceeds the limits of what is due to nature. Lonergan then does not ultimately fall into the trap of confusing innate desire and conscious desire uh, as de Lubach seemed to have done. For Lonergan, Thomas Aquinas' concern is not with pure nature, but with the intelligibility of this world order. Regarding de Lubach's worry about pure nature, Lonergan presents a nuanced response. He affirmed de Lubach's concern to point out that God created natures and that these natures are embedded in a concrete world order. He believed in accord with de Lubach's later position that a world without grace is a concrete possibility. Nevertheless, he suggested that the concrete possibility of pure nature is not a central doctrine, but merely a marginal theorem. Lonergan's position seems more consonant in my judgment with Jean-Pierre Torel's privileging of the term integral nature, okay? Natura integra, over pure nature when referring to Aquinas' position. Integral nature preserves both the gratuity of grace, all right, integral, both the gratuity of grace and the kind of autonomy of the natural order. Lonergan spent a significant amount of time in his early academic career coming to grips with the complexity of Thomas Aquinas' theology of grace. As he gratefully acknowledged, the years spent reaching up to the mind of Aquinas changed him profoundly. Lonergan's first treatment of nature in the scholastic context concerns the explanatory role it plays in conversations about grace and freedom. To state it in summary form, without nature, one is only left with a grace-sin dialectic. The category nature made possible a more rigorous articulation of grace as both healing and grace as elevating. No one doubted that grace was a free gift from God beyond the desert of the human person. The difficulty was to explain why everything was not grace. 
The pivotal moment was Philip the Chancellor's formulation of the idea of the supernatural habit. With, this the with his theorem of the supernatural, Philip did not posit simply the supernatural character of grace, but also the theoretical validity of a line of reference termed nature. Affirming both the natural desire to see God and the supernaturality of its fulfillment in the beatific vision raises a question about human ends. Does the human person have two ends, one natural and the other supernatural? In terms of the recurring debate over the duplex ordo, Lonergan affirms the language of two ends for the human person. The human natural end is an imperfect and analogical knowledge of the divine essence, and the human supernatural end is the beatific vision. I will suggest later other possible language to get at uh, a similar reality. The distinctiveness of Lonergan's argument as it relates to nature resides in his, re his rejection of a particular way of framing the debate, namely a static essentialist view of the world. Static essentialism, in Lonergan's view, conceives finite natures as prior to the world order. It is the static essentialist view that resides at the root of the two-story conception of the universe associated with 16th and 17th century neo-scholasticism brought to light by de Lubac. The two parts of the world order in this view are imagined as kind of distinct and separate. Instead of envisioning, as Lonergan does, a positive relation whereby the higher the higher part subsumes the lower, retaining the intelligibility of the lower by perfecting it, there is simply the negative relation of non-contradiction. The relationship between the natural and the, uh, the supernatural and the natural is constituted in this view, the two-story view, as a kind of just by non-repugnance. The natural certainly does not resist the excess of the supernatural in this view, but it is difficult to imagine with this frame a richer, more transformative and vibrant relationship that might be detected in the mystics, for example. In contrast to static essentialism, Lonergan's open intellectualism, the second column there, offers an account of a unitary, dynamic, cosmic world order that exists prior to finite natures. In sum, finite natures are derivative possibilities in an intelligible world order where lower natures are subordinate to higher natures, not merely extrinsically, but also intrinsically, as appears in chemical composition and in biological evolution. For Lonergan, the natural and the supernatural, you might say, are intrinsically related parts of a single, concrete, cosmic order. Lonergan's explanation of the world order in terms of a emergent, prob emergent probability represents his transposition of Aquinas' account of contingent being into the terms of the complementarity of classical and statistical procedures of empirical science. Emergent probability yields not a universe whose laws could be theoretically deduced according to some iron necessity, but a universe of emergent probability open to the rhythms of limitation and transcendence and constitutive of the dialectical tension between essential and effective freedom, human freedom. Emergent probability offers a theoretical framework that does justice to the actual world order in, in, in which things persist and things change it does not just concentrate on fixed natures, but in an ongoing discovery of the intelligible relationships governing the world order as it concretely exists, an order in which new things have various probabilities of emerging. Lonergan's emergent probability reflects some key insights from contemporary conversations in science and religion. His thought paves the way for integration of the wisdom of Thomistic metaphysics in a more contemporary cosmological vein. The integrity of nature, integral nature, reframed here with more attention to the natural sciences, includes an evolution toward the complexity of life. Lonergan's account of the intelligibility of classical laws and statistical laws of regularity and chance, along with the relative autonomy of intelligent and free human persons to shape the world, contributes to this understanding. Which brings us to two central themes for Lonergan related to the natural desire for God, vertical finality and obediential potency. Vertical finality denotes an emergent upward directed drive that gives lower beings the capacity to set the conditions for the emergence of higher beings. The important insight for this conversation on the natural desire for God is the way Lonergan, in his explanatory account of the universe, preserves the distinction between nature and supernature, derived by analogy 
from the interactions among the gradations of being and enables us to understand more clearly the absolute, well, we'll see, but I'm suggesting it help, helps us understand more clearly the absolute gratuity of grace. Accordingly, higher levels on the natural plane, if you will, are relatively supernatural, not absolutely supernatural, but relatively supernatural to lower ones. That is, chemical compounds are relatively supernatural in relation to subatomic particles. By vertical finality, there is an upward directive dynamism from the lower to the higher. Lower levels set the conditions for the emergence of higher levels. In sum, this natural desire only reveals for Lonergan that there is, and this brings us to the second theme, an obedi obediential potency for the vision of God. Vertical finality opens up an analogical possibility. Just as the lower can set the conditions for the emergence of the higher, the concrete plurality of human beings, analogously, by analogy, have the obediential potency to receive the free self-communication of God. Grace does not annihilate our upward-directed drive to understand, to judge, and to choose, but fulfills such a drive with a disproportionate, absolutely supernatural reality. The supernatural, then, is not, in some ways, not extrinsic, uh, but is a really integral part of the concrete world process. Lonergan's explanatory framework concerning the intelligibility of the world order helps to elucidate, as Raymond Maloney has argued, the Lubach's insistence on the human desire, the orientation of the mind to the beatific vision. Lonergan's framing of the issue in terms of the concrete world order, emergent probability, vertical finality, obediential potency, responds to de Lubach's emphasis on concrete, historic human nature. If we consider the emergence of the supernatural, Maloney says, not according to classical and necessary laws, but according to statistical laws and schemes of probability, then one can retain the intelligibility that Lubach was, was reaching for while, dis, while disowning any intrinsic uh, and necessary ordination of the natural uh, to the supernatural. Lonergan on the supernatural. And the, uh, the icon you see here is uh, uh, Lonergan and the Trinity, contemplating the Trinity. If the natural desire for meaning and truth propelled by the erotic drive of the mind orients us to desire God's essence, do we also possess a supernatural desire that orients us to the beatific vision? What shape might this take if we acknowledge the shift in emphasis from a natural desire for God conceived within categories of scholastic faculty psychology to the variety of ways the question of God arises in intellectual, moral, and religious dimensions of our concrete lives? Does the language of supernatural desire itself indicate uh, an extrinsicist account of the relationship between the natural and the supernatural? An extrinsicist account of nature and grace tends to depict the relationship between the natural and the supernatural as if there were one set of desires over here hermetically sealed off from another set of desires over there. The supernatural is presented as superimposed as a kind of artificial superstructure or arbitrary imposition on the real or the natural aspirations of the human spirit. That's a kind of caricature, but I, I, I just wanted to, to make the point that way. To this end, I respond to Lawrence Feingold's challenge to develop an alternative model that develops the relationship between the natural and the supernatural in a non-extrinsicist way, but that gives priority to the language of Aquinas, especially an account of the supernatural habitual inclination for the, vi the vision of God resulting from sanctifying grace. This analysis continues to integrate, as was the case in the previous section of the lecture, the work of Lonergan and some of his contemporary interpreters. In order to transpose the elevating habits of sanctifying grace and habit of charity into the interpersonal language of being in love. And in a related manner, this section draws on the Trinitarian four-point hypothesis to, envisit, to, envi uh, to envision, you might say, this supernatural being in love as a grace participation in Trinitarian life. Sanctifying grace and the habit of charity, articulated in terms of being in love, are not extrinsic to, but permeate and shape our most intimate loves, I suggest. Feingold's trenchant critique of De Lubach should not be read as an embrace of extrinsicism. Some have uh, accused him of that, and I think it's just wrong. The two-story metaphor obscures, Feingold says, 
the unique interrelation between the orders. In a clear rejection of extrinsicism, Feingold submits that the two orders cannot be sealed off from one another, since human nature has a specific obediential potency to receive the beatific vision. Although Feingold deliberately avoids an extrinsicist account, are there still not other ways to envision the relationship between sanctifying grace and the human person, operating within the climate of religious experience and the level of interpersonal relations? Sanctifying Grace and the Habit of Charity. In his work, Grace and Freedom, Lonergan employs the metaphysical category of habit to articulate the operative habitual grace that is called sanctifying grace. For Lonergan, habits are a human necessity. The frailty, the frailty of the human condition suggests that we cannot reason ourselves into the right attitude before every act. Habits make actions easier and more agreeable. Deliberate vigilance will not sustain, we might say, he imagines, if only he puts his mind to it, the sinner can resist every temptation. But Lonergan says, we can't always be putting our mind to it. Human beings cannot always be on, and hence it is inevitable that we find recourse in the spontaneous orientation of our wills. A life of flourishing rests on the kind of habitual orientation that shapes our desire, the desire that orients our inquiring and knowing and choosing and loving. The human will, as Lonergan notes, does not swing back to perfect equilibrium of indifference with every, side of the, with every tick of the clock. Present orientation tends to be determined by past operations, though not absolutely determined. All right, so we had the human condition there. How, do, how does he respond to that? This change agent is what Lonergan, following Aquinas, calls sanctifying grace. For Aquinas, different kinds of grace are correlative terms, operative and cooperative, habitual and actual, sanctifying and gratuitous. The kind of grace that Lonergan has in mind is operative grace. God acts in us without us. Habitual grace, or sanctifying grace as habitual, abiding habit, giving us new powers for action. And finally, sanctifying. It makes us holy and unites us uh, to our ultimate end. In Method and Theology, Lonergan transposes this scholastic articulation of grace in the more intimate language of the state of being in love with God in an unrestricted manner and identifies this state with sanctifying grace. This state does not result from the human initiative. It is a conscious and dynamic state of love and joy and peace along with the other fruits of the spirit. For Lonergan, this state is conscious without necessarily being known or fully grasped. In other words, it is a mysterious reality experienced, but not necessarily grasped in understanding or affirmed in judgment. This unmeasured love is attractive and fascinating, awe-inspiring and holy. It is a gift we are possessed by and grasped by. If the language of sanctifying grace speaks of a permanent change in the inclination or the spontaneous orientation of the will in a more metaphysical fashion, this new language speaks of quote, a new horizon in which the love of God will transvalue our values. And the eye of that love will transform our knowing. The ineffable open-endedness of our capacity for self-transcendence transposes the scholastic concept of obediential potency and is transformed, enlarged, sublated by a love that is otherworldly, a love in search of meaning beyond the confines of this world. Lonergan's identification of sanctifying grace with being in love with God in an unrestricted manner prompts us to ask about the habit of charity, identified as we just saw in Lonergan's early treatment of grace. The Aristotelian framework on which a Thomistic theology of sanctifying grace was based required a distinction between sanctifying grace and the habit of charity. Sanctifying grace was considered entitative, rooted in the essence of the soul, while the habit of charity was accidental rooted in the potency of the soul. When one is attempting to transpose these distinctions from a, metaphysic, a metaphysical context to religious interiority, one must ask whether this distinction survives. It could be that sanctifying grace and the habit of charity appeal to the same reality in our conscious experience. Lonergan even admitted that his identification of sanctifying grace and being in love with God is a kind of uh, amalgamation of sanctifying grace and charity. 
But following Bob Doran, uh, Doran maintains the distinction in order to avoid a retreat into undifferentiated common sense about interiority and for its systematic explanatory power in providing a hypothetical understanding of how it can be true that we do indeed de de enjoy distinct created relations to each of the three uncreated divine persons as terms of these relations. So a little bit more on Trinitarian theology. The four-point hypothesis, the Trinitarian structure of the supernatural. In the four-point hypothesis, Lonergan and Doran identify grace as a set of created participations in the supernatural life of God. Grace, in other words, possesses a distinctly Trinitarian structure. The four-point hypothesis identifies four absolutely supernatural ways of imitating God through a created participation in the divine relations. Guided by the logic of contingent predication, these participations do not constitute a change in the divine relations themselves, but do create a real, created participation in the divine nature. Though there are four supernatural realities in Lonergan's schema, I limit my analysis here to the particular divine relations con connected to the created imitations and participations of sanctifying grace and the habit of charity. And so Doran states uh, his analogy uh, as follows. First, the divine relation of active spiration connects to the created reality of sanctifying grace. Okay, so we have the left, the left column there. In other words, sanctifying grace imitates and participates in the Father and the Son together as they breathe the Holy Spirit and so bears a special relation to the uncreated Holy Spirit. Second, we go to the right column. The divine relation of passive spiration connects to the created reality of the habit of charity. The habit of charity proceeds from the reception of sanctifying grace and participates in the preceding love breathed by and proceeding from the Father and the Son, and so bears a special inverse relation to the Father and Son. The habit of charity animates the return of good for evil in an abiding friendship with God. The shift to interpersonal relations, new relation to the same end. Sanctifying grace and the habit of charity directly relate to the lecture's theme of supernatural desire, or as I will re-articulate in a minute, the elevation of human desire to a new, created, supernatural relation to that end. Scholars have debated the question of how sanctifying grace ought to be articulated in a more methodical uh, theology, a theology grounded in the conscious operations and states of the existential subject. The metaphysical terms provide a fruitful and much needed control of meaning. For Doran, the key to this transposition is, more is a more explicit treatment of the level of interpersonal relations. When marked with self-transcendence, this level includes the love of intimacy, devotion to the human community, the reception of God's love and the return uh, of love for God and charity. The distinguishing character of this level is not the supernatural as opposed to the natural, but a concern with the other, with the presence of the beloved in the lover. This interpersonal level makes possible the conscious relation between the conscious subject and the other with whom the subject is in love. This level of interpersonal relations is constituted by self-gift, the very handing over of one's central form to the determination of another in love. In light of the relational matrix, I propose that the supernatural does not offer a new end, and this is you know, maybe speculative here, does not offer a new end, but a new relation to the same end who is God. In terms of final causality, the supernatural cannot add a new end beyond what is already given naturally, but must be a new mode of attainment of that goal. Since grace perfects nature rather than replacing nature, it is more fitting to frame this in the language of re relationality and continuity. In other words, human beings have a natural orientation to God as knowable and lovable with an unrestricted reach. The supernatural is not a new final cause then, but a new created relation to that end. In this instance, it is not simply a matter of the relationship between creature and creator. This is because if the human person actually attains here God as God is, in say, then these new supernatural relations would be created participations in the internal relations of Trinitarian life. 
This solution involves the rich interconnection between Trinitarian theology and the grace-nature distinction that I attempted in some small way to highlight above. This line of reasoning contributes to Feingold's challenge to account for the elevation of natural desire into a supernatural inclination to the vision of God through the reception of sanctifying grace. Lonergan, along with Doran and somebody like Neil Ormerod, preserves the distinction between the natural and the supernatural, but also transposes this distinction into the context of interpersonal relations, which helps us avoid what we might call an extrinsicist account of natural and supernatural ends. The final part uh, of the lecture, saints and the desire for God in history. In Love Alone is Credi Credible, Hanserus von Balthasar quipped that, and I quote, lovers are the ones who know most about God, the theologian must listen to them. And at a lecture at Gonzaga University, Gan Gonzaga University, more like it, Lonergan himself challenged those of us who study theology to be attentive to religious experience. It is only in the climate of religious experience, Lonergan wrote, that our thinking about God flourishes. Imitation of the Trinity and the metaphysics of holiness. First, a bit of explanatory ground. I am suggesting here that the working of grace in history is a matter of created imitations of and participations in the divine relations. To be an image, a mago dei in history involves an active reception of divine grace, a participation in Trinitarian relations. To develop a more explanatory account of holiness rooted in Trinitarian categories, I build here briefly on Lonergan's Trinitari Trinitarian theology discussed in the previous section. The basic assumption is that the call to holiness is a historical expression of our participation in and imitation of the divine nature. The four types of holiness that correspond to the divine relations and the created participations in these divine relations are uh, uh, simple sanctity. Do you see the right column up there? Corresponds to sanctifying grace. Apostolic sanctity corresponds to passive spiration, the habit of charity. The saint as sage corresponds to what Lonergan talks about as the secondary essay of the incarnation, the, the human nature of Jesus. Uh, the indwelling of divine wisdom. And finally, saint as mystic, all right, corresponds to the beatific vision. I focus here on simple sanctity, sanctifying grace, and apostolic sanctity, the habit of charity. All right, so the first two uh, on the column. This constitutes, in short, an emphasis on being on the receiving end of unqualified love and the invitation to love in an unqualified fashion in return. This is emphasized, uh, exemplified by a return of good for evil, which is present wherever the gift of the Holy Spirit has been gratefully received, however anonymously. So active spiration uh, and sanctifying grace, simple sanctity. So if, uh, if you recall uh, that, uh, and I'll just talk on this in a second, that active spiration corresponds to being in love with God in an unrestricted manner. So in terms of uh, sanctity, uh, we might think of these uh, as an emphasis on the consoling, complacent love, an invitation to rest in the love of God and to be transformed, being on the receiving end uh, of God's love. Passive aspiration, habit of charity, apostolic sanct uh, sanctity, and these are just models, right? Uh, uh, correspond to a habitual orientation of enacting God's love in the world, loving God with heart, mind, and soul, and neighbors ourselves working for the kingdom, embracing uh, good for evil, what Lonergan calls uh, the law of the cross. Therese of Lisieux, love in the heart of the church. One of the dominant images of Therese, technically known as St. Therese of the Child of Jesus uh, and the Holy Face, is the little flower. It seems to me, writes Therese, that if a little flower could speak, that if a little flower could speak, it would tell simply what God has done for it without trying to hide its blessings. While the designation of little flower sounds sweet, it can also be interpreted as Therese's genius for sisterhood, her way of placing herself as an equal in the midst of the masses of simple folk who will never be specifically noticed 
or, or, uh, or claimed. Therese, of course, had intense desires to do great things and was tortured by these great desires. It was only in the discovery of her vocation that the torture subsided. Her story reveals, as does Eddie Hillisom's, that when we come to rest in God, we become single-hearted creatures, that the, this path to simplicity is complex, often torturous, fraught with painfully conflicting desires and dreams. The simple sanctity of the little way is a constitutive dimension of Therese's contribution. The little way is a process, to use uh, Hanser's von Balthasar's terms, the process of demolition. It demolishes an obsession with performing great deeds. It demolishes religious facades. The living flame of love sends the saints to spread the fire, not to be dampened by bourgeois Christianity. Therese was a fighter by nature, fearless and assertive, which explains her devotion to St. Joan of Arc, about whom she wrote poetry and even penned a play. Therese's battle was to rid Christianity of the temptation to assert one's own greatness. She was, therefore, skeptical of ascetical practice that, practices that seemed to aim at human perfection. Preferring spiritual childhood over religious greatness, Therese believed sanctity consists in not, not in successfully performing great religious acts, but in being ready to become small and humble in the arms of God, acknowledging in a radical way our own weaknesses and vulnerability, trusting in the goodness of God. In light of my emphasis on the interpersonal dimension of religious experience, it is pertinent to note that Therese's relationship with God was never controlled by legal language, but always bore the marks of the interpersonal. To the average Christian, this love may seem overdone. To the unbeliever, it may seem childish. To those standing outside a relationship of love in general, this inner secret realm with a far-ranging geography seems incomprehensible. But even if misunderstood, lovers delight in roaming in such spaces. The little way demands simple surrender and gratitude. And Therese wanted to be a warrior and she wanted to be a missionary, uh, but discovered in meditating on 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, she realized that uh, even the most heroic deeds are nothing without love. So that was the simple sanctity of Therese and now the habit of charity in Therese. Feasting at the table of unbelief. Having examined the unity of action in contemplation, or at least gesturing uh, to the unity of action and contemplation. The inseparability of active and passive spiration, I turn to Therese's embodiment of the habit of charity. Again, the habit of charity is, in Lonergan's turn, the antecedent willingness to respond to evil with love. It is the habitual orientation of enacting God's love in the world. It is the imitation of and participation in passive spiration. I talked briefly about just, I, I offered two brief examples of her embodiment of the habit of charity. First, in manuscript C, Therese addresses the difficulty of the habit of charity, especially to those whom we have a natural antipathy, th for those who annoy us, to those who, as we say uh, in English, you know, get who get under our skin. Yet it is precisely in loving the latter that our love becomes divine. Therese despised a sister, for example, in her convent. And yet, in her wisdom, admits that this sister must be pleasing to God, somehow pleasing to God. All right, think about those with whom you live in community. All right, exhibiting the habit of charity, the very imitation of passive spiration, Therese reflects and she says, I, hold myself, I, I told myself that charity must not consist in feelings, but in works. Then I set myself to doing for this sister what I would do for the person I love the most. Second, Therese... Uh, willingly feasted at the table of sorrow, what she calls the dark banquet of bitter bread. Therese embraced something akin to the dark night of the soul. Her experience of the night, which is where she lived most of the time, was integral to her mission of charity to unbelievers. She, she subjectively, uh, in her interior life, absorbed, absorbed the pain and alienation of unbelief experienced widely then and today in our secular age. During Easter of 1896, after Good Friday, when she first spat up blood, she was very ill. God showed her, as she interprets the experience, that there really are people who have no faith. Therese writes, he permitted my soul to be invaded by the thickest darkness, and that the thought of heaven up until then, so sweet to me, 
be no longer anything but the cause of struggle and torment. This trial was, was to the last not a few days, to last not a few days or weeks. It was not to be extinguished until the, Latin, until the hour set by God himself, and this hour was not yet to come. One would have to travel through the dark tunnel to understand its darkness, end quote. One of the fundamental points about the habit of charity that she learns is that charity is not always a feeling but an act of the will. In the midst of darkness, she begs for mercy for her unbelieving brothers and resigns herself to sit with these poor sinners at the table filled with bitterness. Eddie Hillisum, and this is the final example, the thinking heart of the barracks. If Therese of Lisieux is accessible through her profound yet challenging little way, Eddie Hillisum is for some contemporary seekers perhaps more accessible. Her vivacious demeanor, her erotic pursuits and struggles, her rearing in a house gifted with intellectual and artistic acumen and complicated also by mental illness, and her spiritual pluralism make her, make her even more relatable to many sojourners in the secular age. Despite her eclectic spirituality, it seems plausible for a theologian to discern the vestiges of Trinitarian love at work in the broken, interrupted, unfinished life uh, like Eddie Hillisum's, presuming from my perspective as a Catholic theologian that the Trinitarian God of love continually uh, breaks into history. Benedict XVI helps us discern this present more specifically in the life of Eddie. In his Ash Wednesday audience, given shortly after he announced his resignation, Benedict narrated familiar examples of religious conversion. So maybe some of you have read this, such as St. Paul or St. Augustine. But sensitive to the secular age and the prevailing eclipse of the sense of the sacred, that those are his terms, he also challenged his audience to, note, to notice God's grace is at work and works marvels in the life of so many people. And this is Benedict. The Lord never tires of knocking at man's door in social and cultural milieus that seem engulfed in secularization, he said. Benedict highlights Eddie Hillisum as a particular example to be noted in a secular age. Benedict adds, as, as her uh, disrupted restless life, in her disruptive restless life, she found God in the very midst of the great tragedy of the 20th century. Shoah, the Holocaust. This frail and dissatisfied young woman, transfigured by faith, became a woman full of love and inner peace who was able to declare, and I quote, I live in constant intimacy with God. So the little way of Eddie, the quest for simplicity and contemplative rest in God. It is possible to discern in, in, in Hillisum's journals something akin to the simple sanctity of Therese, it is not altogether obvious that she understands the God to whom she refers over 400 times in her journals as the God of Judaism and Christianity. Still, as time progresses and as the Jewish situation in Amsterdam worsens, Eddie develops a more intimate, loving relationship with God. We witness a transition from her speaking of God in the third person to an I-thou encounter. In a letter from Westerbork, Eddie recounts her journal entry from the very afternoon to her friend, Tide. You have made me so rich, O oh God. Please let me share uh, uh, out your beauty with open hands. My life has become an uninter an uninterrupted dialogue with you, O oh God. One great dialogue. This loving rest in God is captured by a key image in her journals. Very powerful image, that of kneeling. Eddie described herself as the girl who could not kneel, but who would later become a kneeler in training. The girl who could not kneel but learned to do so on the rough coconut matting in an untidy bathroom. Such things are often more intimate than even sex, she says. The language that animates these passages, thou and kneeling and love and intimacy, expresses the kind of relationality that marked Lonergan's later emphasis on being in love. In the place of continually anticipating the future, which began to take on for Hillisum a sense of doom, that she would be part of the mass extermination of Jews under Hitler, she continually reflects on the meaning of the quotidian and the beauty of love. She says, every minute of this day seems one great gift and consolation, a memory I shall carry within me as an ever-present reality. What matters are the concerns of daily life. Similar to Therese, the journals of Hillisum reveal an ongoing process of pruning herself of the desire for greatness, what I have called the demolition of great deeds. Just as Therese desired to be a missionary, Hillisum desired to be a great writer, but she said to herself, 
as she reflected on her life as it was coming toward the end. Wash your hands of all attempts to embody those great sweeping thoughts. The subject right before you is more important than these prodigious thoughts of Tolstoy or Napoleon that occurred to you in the middle of the night. And the lesson you gave that keen young girl, she was a tutor, a Russian tutor, and that keen young girl on Friday night is more important than all your vague philosophizings. As Hillerson's spiritual quest deepened, she became more committed to simplicity of speech and lifestyle, discipline and work, faithfulness in the little things, and finding God in the concreteness of her life. Sometimes she said, I long for the, con uh, the convent cell with the wisdom of centuries set out on bookshelves before me. There I would immerse myself in the wisdom of the ages, but then she comes back and says, uh, no, it's right here in this very place uh, that I am called to live out my way. Finally, the habit of charity, a balm for all wounds. Hillisum's contemplative being in love with God, her imitation of and participation in active spiration, is connected to her love and care for others in a dire moment of history. In what way did Hillisum embody apostolic sanctity? Well, I offer two examples. Uh, one is she cared uh, deeply for those who were suffering. She desired, she said, to be a balm for all wounds and a thinking heart uh, of the barracks. And so she spent time uh, in the camps willingly uh, caring for others. Second of all, she, ex she uh, exemplified the habit of charity and her return of good uh, for evil. It seems possible to discern a key dimension of the habit of charity. All right, or what we might call the law of the cross, or the, sermon on the, uh, the wisdom of the Sermon on the Mount, the, the command to return evil with love. While there are many legitimate moral responses to mass atrocity, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is an example of a different way. Hillism's little way of fighting against hatred embodies the habit of charity in history. One finds uh, a, a kind of pruning of herself away from, from envy uh, and, and hatred. For example, she writes, it is the problem of our age. Hatred of Germans poisons everyone's mind. I had a liberating thought that surfaced it in me like a hesitant, tender young blade of grass thrusting its way through a wilderness of weeds. If there were only one decent German, then he should be cherished despite the whole barbaric gang. And because of that one decent German, it is wrong to pour hatred over an entire people. And so I conclude. I have argued in this lecture that Lonergan's thought bears the resources for responding to the Lubakian emphasis on the concrete and historical nature, you might say, on the one hand, and on the Neo-Thomas call to develop a more substantive, ontologically dense understanding of nature on the other hand. I have proposed a particular response to the question of whether the human desire for God is natural or supernatural. In response to Feingold's important challenge, I have argued as follows. While the natural desire for meaning and truth orient uh, one to desire God's essence, the supernatural gifts of sanctifying grace and the habit of charity con uh, constitute a new relation, a habitual inclination to the same end, the fullness of Trinitarian life. Resonant with the Ressourcement tradition's emphasis on the saints, I offer the lives of Therese and Eddie as a way of witnessing to the human desire for God and the habitual inclination to the fullness of God in history. Thank you. Grazie professore per questa ricchissima relazione eh, carica di, di spunti antropologici, teologici, eh, indubbiamente ci sono molti punti che possono essere ulteriormente anche ripresi e adesso eh, per quanto riguarda anche il nostro tabellone di marcia abbiamo due persone in particolare che fungono da respondent e quindi invito il primo, il padre Thomas Sherman, professore della facoltà di filosofia, a prendere la parola come primo respondent a questa relazione che abbiamo appena sentito. Prego professore.
Thank you, Professor Rosenberg. Your, your paper was, was very rich. I don't, uh, I don't pretend to try to um, address all your points, even most of them. In fact, what I'd like to do is I'd like to focus on uh, two issues. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, look at Feingold. Feingold gave us these four states of natural desire for God, and he states in his first, uh, the first state of human desire that we have a desire to know, uh, know God that is innate and unconscious. Now I want to offer some critical comments on that first state. Notice Feingold is using, or claims he's using Aquinas for these four uh, states. But Aquinas uses the phrase natural desire or love for God, not just for human beings, but for all creatures, desirous of their proper good, including irrational and inanimate creatures. I, I will forego uh, citing the, the passages in the Summa. As all goodness is in some way a similitude of divine being. So all creatures desire God. What does that mean? They desire God, they love God, not explicitly. They love God in desiring their own proper good. Human beings' desire for God does not imply an actual positive desire for God as an object of common human striving. For precisely this reason, Aquinas is able to maintain a qualitative distinction between the desire for God inspired by grace, which is an actual positive desire, and the natural desire for God that grace presupposes. For Aquinas, all creatures naturally desire God in desiring their proper good, their complete actuality. Not all creatures, of course, are aware of this desire. The distinguishing capacity of the human being as a rational animal is precisely the capacity to know and to direct ourselves to our own proper good by acting on the basis of a rational apprehension of that good. And at another point in the Summa, first part of the second part, 3.5, Aquinas identifies that proper good for human beings as the happiness of a life consisting in the fullest possible exercise of the speculative intellect in contemplation, together with the rational control of passions and actions by the practical intellect. Where is God in that? Yet, Aquinas also says our fundamental intellectual desire for intelligibility ensures that, properly understood, human happiness consists in the direct vision of God. Aquinas is not being inconsistent here. As intellectual creatures, we human beings naturally explicitly desire our own happiness or fulfillment. And once we are able to come to know that God exists, we can have an explicit desire to know. We can. But even if human beings come to know of God's existence, this knowledge does not in and of itself necessitate a desire for God. For the knowledge of God attainable in this life is not God himself, but rather the proposition that the cause of the existence of everything of the existence of everything exists. First part, three, four. But one, so that my knowledge of God in this life as a human being does not necessitate, necessitate my desire for God because it's only one good of many other goods. According to a faith perspective, God reveals himself beyond what human beings can naturally know of him and offers human beings the grace to accept that revelation and to live accordingly. But even from this faith perspective, the grace of faith needed to accept God's supernatural self-revelation can be refused. 
If accepted, the grace of faith enables human beings to recognize that their original natural desire for happiness was potentially the desire for the beatific vision. Only in retrospect, from a faith perspective, can we say this. But this takes a supernatural faith perspective. Without that perspective, what can be affirmed of the object of natural human desire is happiness or human fulfillment, however that happiness is understood. For as a matter of fact, not everyone recognizes that happiness, even true happiness, can only be found in the vision of God. And consequently, not everyone desires this true happiness. For Aquinas, these people are mistaken in what true happiness consists in, but they are not mistaken about what they really desire, the happiness of a life of power, or fame, or riches. So for Aquinas, humans have a natural desire for happiness, but this desire is not explicitly a desire for God. So, contra hold, I do not find ev any evidence in Aquinas for an innate and unconscious desire for God, nor for that matter any notion of an implicit or pre-thematic desire for communion with God that is innate in human nature. Moreover, since desire for Aquinas is a desire for something known, and of oneself as knowing that good, the very idea of an innate unconscious desire for God or for anything else seems incoherent. Now, what about Lonergan? I'm just going to mention a few things here with, uh, for, uh, in response to Lonergan's natural desire for a supernatural knowledge of God. Like Aristotle and Aquinas, Lonergan understands the dynamism of the human mind in the natural desire to know. An unrestricted desire, insofar as the adequate object of this desire is, ends. The natural desire to know includes an explicit desire to know God only when God is known as really existing. The concept of obediential potency used to understand our natural desire for supernatural knowledge of God is problematic. According to Aquinas, obediential potency was a concept developed in the theology of miracles. In this original context, the creature is purely passive, God acting on it in the way he wills in whatever way that is not repugnant repugnant to its nature. Precisely because obediential potency implies pure passivity and total indetermination, Aquinas found it inadequate to express the relationship between intellectual natures and supernatural reality of God. He held instead that as an image of God, human beings have a capacity for grace and are ordered to or habituated to grace and so have a natural desire to see God, even though the supernatural transcends their nature. Some theologians after Aquinas, for instance, Cajetan, understood the creature to be completely passive with respect to God's agency. Others, for instance, Suarez, understood obediential potency of rational creatures to be somehow active. But there are at least two problems with this use. If we take obediential potency to be passive, we risk understanding the relationship between the supernatural and the natural in purely extrinsic terms, not respecting the nature of grace as presupposing and perfecting nature. Eh, chiedo scusa hand, professor Sherman, vorrei richiamarla a momento al tempo, se può gentilmente, il suo tempo è ormai esaurito, erano circa dieci minuti, abbiamo un secondo rispondente, la, la invito okay. gentilmente a restringere e chiudere il suo intervento. Okay. La ringraziamo so, per questa okay, so generosità. One final, one final Grazie. So, um, well, two fine. <laughs> Moreover, an idea of innate natural desire to see God would require an account of why such a desire seems absent in the writings of pre-Christian thinkers, such as Aristotle and Confucius and Lao Tzu, and denied by many agnostics and atheists. Finally, 
While Lonergan rightly affirms the language of duplex order, ordo, a human natural end, Aquinas' imperfect happiness, and a supernatural end in the beatific vision, and considers these ends as analogous, he maintains that, page 11 of Professor, uh, Professor's paper, in quote, the supernatural is not intrinsic to, but really integral, a integral part of the evolutionary world process, unquote. His use, Lonergan's use of emergent probability with respect to an alleged natural process to understand the relation between the natural and the supernatural, vertical finality, appears to threaten the traditionally understood double gratuity of grace by naturalizing grace as an evolutionary process. By so naturalizing grace in this way, the gratuity of grace seems to be threatened, if not altogether abandoned and with it a possible abandonment of God as a strictly supernatural reality. If so, Lonergan would appear to be returning to a philosophical theology not unlike Aristotle, where God is identical or part of nature rather than transcending nature. Thank you. Bene, grazie. E adesso daremo la parola al padre Paul Rai, direttore dell'Istituto di Spiritualità dell'Università Gregoriana. Poi dopo il, il relatore avrà modo anche di riprendere la parola. Dopo. Good evening. Il desiderio di vedere Dio, naturale o soprannaturale, by Professor Randall S. Rosenbach of St. Louis University, is a solid research paper having the length, the breadth, and the depth of philosophy and theology, neo-scholasticism and resourcement theology, and the insights of uh, Thomas Aquinas, Henry de Labarque, and Lonergan. It is a fascinating paper having the deeper understanding on the key aspects of Lonergan's thought. The paper is logical cohesive, and spiritual. It concentrates on the themes of reflection in progress and the challenges not faced yet from the writings of Lonergan. The paper starts with the fundamental research question. Is the human desire for God natural or supernatural? To address that question, the author proceeds the following. The systematic proposal of new scholastic resurgence analyzing the resources from the thought of Lonergan. Then this follows the natural desire for God and the supernatural desire for God. Finally, building on the categories developed, he reflects on uh, the two saints. And so, dear friends, uh, there is a flow like a river from the beginning to the end of the paper. In the first part, Tom has already um, questioned a certain uh, uh, dilemma of accepting the first point, and so I leave it aside. In the second part of the paper, the author rightly brings in the key aspects of Lonergan's thought, mindful on the one hand of the Lubeckian's legitimate concern with the concrete and historical, and on the other hand, of the call of many Thomas. In that way, he has com compared well. For Lonergan, the human desire to know is natural in so far as the desires of the intellect are manifested in questions for meaning, truth, and value. It is also transcendent in so far as the adequate object of God is ends. The author without doubt agrees with Lonergan that the natural desire includes God and can only be fulfilled supernaturally in the beatific vision. I have come across this even in uh, the Oriental uh, uh, theology. For example, in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Arjuna is trying to uh, get the beatific vision from the grace of uh, Krishna himself. He is uh, asking for and Krishna reveals the, the beatific vision. It is something uh, very much connected with the, the Oriental and uh, uh, Occidental uh, theological pattern. The author concludes with the, the three consonances between uh, Lonergan and Feingold, on which I have, uh, uh, on the third part, I have certain things to clarify later. 
On the third part, the author gets into the difficult part of uh, the supernatural desire for God. Without in any way relativizing the idea of Lonergan, the author argues well on the supernatural desire for God. If the natural desire for meaning and truth orients us to desire God's essence, do we also possess the supernatural desire that orients us to the beatific vision, which is the ultimate fulfillment of our natural desire for God? He uses the Lonergan's idea of sanctifying grace and the habit of charity, in my opinion, is laudable. The metaphysical distinction of sanctifying grace and the habit of charity ought to be transposed into the categories of being on the receiving end of God's unqualified and unconditional love, that is a sanctifying grace, and loving God in return with all our hearts and minds and souls and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourselves, that is a habit of charity. The idea, this idea is like walking on a tight robe and my appreciation for the great effort of uh, Professor Randall. In the final part, the author's ability to interconnect the renowned theologians with the two women saints on the theme of desire for God in history is amazing. Having said all this, now I enter into some of my hermeneutical suspicions on the paper. In the first part of the paper, the author is of the opinion that human beings possess an innate desire for our co-natural end, that is to know and love God through the mirror of creation. My dilemma is the following. If human being has the innate desire to know and love God, then what is the role of God, God's grace, in the knowledge of God himself? And what is the role of God's revelation in the Trinitarian understanding of God for us Christians. In other words, what is the meaning of the desire to know God who is innit and unconscious? Second, because of the fact of being a Jesuit, Lonergan had the knowledge, if not profound, on the spiritual exercises of Ignatius and Ignatian spirituality. As I have read the book, Insight of Lonergan, I come across the first and second week of the spiritual exercises very strongly. In the number 104 of the spiritual exercises, Ignatius says, to ask for what I want, what I desire, it will be to ask for the interior knowledge, conocimiento interno, interior knowledge of the Lord, who for me has become man, that I may love him intimately and follow him closely. Lonergan himself says that only in the climate of religious experience that are thinking about God flourishes. If this is the case, my question would be, is Lonergan agreeing totally with the idea of Thomas Aquinas, integral nature that preserves both the gratuity of grace and the autonomy of the natural order? Or is Lonergan parting away from Thomas Aquinas in this case? In the third and fourth part of the paper, the author seems to agree with Lonergan and Doran that the metaphysical distinction of sanctifying grace and the habit of charity. My question would be, will it be justifiable to compartmentalize the sanctifying grace from the habit of charity? Or uh, is it uh, interconnected? Having said this, I wholeheartedly appreciate and congratulate Randall S. Rosenberg of St. Louis University on this excellent and solid research paper, Il Desiderio di Vedere Dio, Naturale o Sopranaturale. On the whole, Professor Randall's desire to see God, natural or supernatural, is an interesting area of research and is original for his investigation on challenges to and suggestions for the relevant Lonergan paradigm. I put it, Lonergan paradigm on the knowledge of God. Thank you. Bene, eh, allora, grazie anche per questo secondo respondent. Siamo arrivati alle 18.30, abbiamo quindi circa 30 minuti in cui possiamo aprire un dibattito con domande. Certamente già i respondent hanno 
eh, posto eh, in qualche modo delle sottolineature eh, hanno dato luogo anche già forse a domande in coloro che li hanno ulteriormente ascoltati e quindi possiamo aprire il dibattito e dare la possibilità al professore anche di rispondere e se mi è consentito eh, vorrei incominciare con una domanda e poi do subito la parola a tutti si sente il microfono? Ah, ecco. Eh, sì, una, una prima... Una... Sì, sì. Oh, eh, ma lo dico in inglese, la facciamo, por, eh, formulo la domanda in inglese. L'Onergan's explanation of the world order in terms of emergent probability eh, in the terms of the complementarity of the classical and the statistical laws is a transposition of Aquinas' account. Eh, sono d'accordo, penso anch'io che sia una trasposizione della, di quello che era stata l'impostazione anche in parte di eh, Tommaso d'Aquino riletto dall'Onergan in una nuova, eh, però con nuove modalità. Eh, la domanda adesso ruota più sulla probabilità emergente. Emergent probability offers a theoretical framework uh, for the actual world order in which things persist and things change. Um, uh, this is valid uh, for science, uh, for philosophy, but uh, not always uh, for me, for religions. Um, today we have uh, um, an evolution towards uh, complexity and, uh, and life, and also there is the desire of uh, personal uh, autonomy in intelligent and free human person. For you, uh, what is the possible better theological approach in the church? Thank you. Ecco, possiamo poi so, certamente aprire anche, non so se thank, vuole rispondere subito, è meglio, preferisce subito e poi riapriamo il dibattito tra quanti già hanno mani okay. alzate okay. e quindi darò certamente la parola a coloro che lo desiderano. Preferisce adesso dare una risposta, grazie. Ok, uh, thank you very much and perhaps I'll respond to uh, the, the, the first two uh, official respondents uh, as much as I can without taking up uh, all the time, but I'm very grateful for uh, their uh, analysis of my paper and their, and their questions. I would probably want to deal with uh, Tom's point, the uh, last point, which is uh, in using emergent probability uh, in Lonergan and some of the language uh, that I use to express uh, uh, the supernatural as a real part of the, the world process, uh, is that sort of naturalizing the supernatural, making the supernatural a kind of, uh, kind of a, a conclusion to uh, emergence that's happening in the universe. I would just want to say uh, that Lonergan would probably be rolling in, in his grave right now if he heard some young guy up, up there trying to naturalize the supernatural. Uh, I grant that some of the language, uh, at least the way I articulated it, uh, could lend itself to that. So let me explain a little bit what's going on. I would want to say, uh, for Lonergan anyway, uh, the supernatural is absolutely uh, supernatural. That was uh, one of the key points of his work on grace and freedom. And uh, even in Insight, which is uh, primarily, if you've read it or you looked at it or you skimmed it, it is a philosophy book uh, where, he, where he gives this analysis of the human person, emergent probability, uh, a proof for the existence of God, among other things. And then he deals at the end with the mystery of evil. And at the end, uh, he offers what he, uh, a kind of heuristic solution to the problem of evil. And what he offers uh, is basically the theological virtues. 
that the solution to the problem of evil in this philosophy book are, are, are the virtues, faith, uh, hope, and charity. And he clearly says in there, they're a supernatural uh, solution uh, to the problem of evil. Uh, in relation to, of course, uh, the natural, as he outlines uh, in the book, but, uh, but without uh, certainly blurring the lines, uh, he, he would not say that, of course, the theological virtues are, are natural. So I want to uh, clarify that, and I appreciate uh, his point. Uh, now, what might make then some uneasy is, he, when I say that the natural or the, the supernatural is a real part of the world process, uh, I'm kind of giving a nod to De Lubach in this concrete universe as it is, the concrete world order, the intelligibility of the world order, uh, there is a, rel a kind of relative superna supernatural, okay? And Lonergan was, uh, it was very important for Lonergan to use in systematic theology what, what he calls natural analogies, analogy from nature. So in Trinitarian theology, we have the psychological analogy for the Trinity, the, the, the process of the, the inner life of the human person as a kind of uh, analogy for how God can be three in one. Uh, in, a, in a related way, what I was doing there is suggesting that one can discern in the concrete universe, or that Lonergan suggests, a kind of relatively supernatural, right? That the physical uh, is relatively supernatural to subatomic particles uh, and so forth. And then he takes that kind of natural analogy and uses it as an analogy. And with an analogy, of course, there, you have similarity, but you have ever greater uh, dissimilarity. So he says, only by analogy then can we think of the human person uh, as having, uh, you know, having the capacity to receive uh, the self-communication of God. That in some ways there's a fittingness in retrospect that we can discern in the universe uh, without saying that it was necessitated and without losing uh, the supernatural disproportionate uh, fulfillment of uh, our natural desires. I also uh, want to say that I agree in large part with uh, uh, Tom's, a lot of his analysis of Aquinas. I was always a little easy, uneasy with Feingold's use of the, the term unconscious. And I take him to, uh, to that this, I take Feingold to mean really that the second desire up there, the naturally elicited, once we know that God exists, then we want to, we want to know God uh, through his essence. As really his summary of the natural desire for God portion of his argument. But with the first desire, unconscious, innate, I think he's just trying to say, uh, without even knowing it, the human person uh, possessing uh, spiritual faculties as we do uh, are sort of oriented to our, uh, our, our end, uh, who is God, even if we're not conscious of that or know that. Lonergan, uh, and I would add a, a, a part that I deal with in the book, but uh, I think there was already enough in the paper, <laughs> as you probably experienced. Uh, he does talk about that the natural desire for the human being is to wonder, and wonder drives us to ask questions for understanding uh, and judgment. And so... Uh, it's a big leap to just say, well, because we wonder, that's God. And so Lonergan would say, what we desire to wonder, and we, we desire to know the truth uh, of things, and that it's not explicitly, uh, a or it's only implicitly a desire for God, because we want to know everything about everything. So he makes a distinction in another writing between implicit objects and explicit objects. All right? It's only an explicit desire for God once we know God exists. And so Lonergan, in another essay that I did not quote in this paper, talks about that uh, pretty explicitly. And I think that might respond a little bit uh, to, to Tom's concern uh, that, that he uh, so eloquently voiced. Um, in terms of the uh, second paper, or the second uh, set of comments, uh, very grateful for a, a faithful summary there. Perhaps um, I can just note a few things on the Ignatian uh, influence uh, on Lonergan. Uh, there's a story that I really don't know all that well, but it, it's passed around in Lonergan circles, that uh, Harvey Egan, the Jesuit, who writes on mysticism and spirituality in Ignatius and Karl Rahner, 
was given a presentation and Lonergan was there and he was talking about uh, the Ignatian elements of Karl Rahner's uh, work. And that was in the late 70s, I believe, yeah? And Lonergan had this moment where he was saying, wow, I mean, I, I also am very Ignatian now that I hear uh, these, th th these points being made. So I guess I would suggest, um, I think the Ignatian was sort of uh, in, in his bones, you know, was part of his formation, influenced uh, his thought, but I think there's a lot of work to still be done on connecting uh, Ignatius uh, and Lonergan, or the Ignatian elements of Lonergan. Some have done so, some have, um, and I know Jerry uh, is working on uh, a theme, this, one of these themes now, Ignatius and Lonergan. But, um, uh, for example, the, the second and third times of election uh, in Ignatius. Uh, you, I think you could, you could link um, in method and theology, uh, where Lonergan talks about a judgment of value that's rooted in affect and resting uh, sort of affectively, would correspond to feelings of consolation and desolation uh, in the second order of election. Uh, but uh, in th that the third uh, time of election, would, where it's, it's quiet and uh, there isn't a lot of affectivity involved, would correspond to Lonergan's judgment of fact, you might say. So I think that's just an example where you have, uh, I think, inherent in some of Lonergan's work, key Ignatian themes that could be reflected on uh, a little further. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for uh, your uh, answers. Eh, ora apriamo il dibattito, abbiamo una mano alzata, una, due, quelle che vedo immediatamente e poi vediamo mano a mano gli altri che vogliono intervenire. Eh, ah, ecco, non la vedevo perché venga avanti perché c'è la parte del, del legno che mi impedisce. Prego. Uh, Vuole dire il suo nome, la sua provenienza, la sua collocazione? Non Jose so. Mario Francisco from uh, the Gregorian in uh, the Philippines. Thank you very much for a masterful uh, paper. The first two parts of your paper, in a sense, deal with nature precisely in answer to, uh, to uh, Henri de Lubac and his concern about pure nature. The, the, the second part, I mean, the second half of the paper shifts or talks about persons. Uh, yeah. Certainly, you, those are connected. Yes. But I would like uh, perhaps a comment on that, yeah. precisely because one of the reasons why pure nature, in a sense, why, why the dominance of, of, uh, of the Delobac uh, insight that everything is grace and nature and, uh, are all the same, is because the other, the underside of that binary is person. Yeah. That nature is different from persons, right. and persons are more important and more primary. Yeah, very, very good question. Thank you. Ecco, raccogliamo anche allora, tutte le, le domande e poi eh, risponde la, il secondo, il eh, prego. Passiamo al terzo. Eh, lo so, però raccogliamo le domande prima, altrimenti. My name is Paul O'Hara. I'm a professor of ontology and scientific method at a new university, Sofia de Focolari, near Florence, formerly as professor of mathematics in Chicago. So I know, know my scientific method. Yes. Um, I liked very much your paper, I have to be honest. I, I know Lonergan reasonably well, I think, and I really liked your approach. I think the, to understand what's happening here, I think we really do have a paradigm shift. So words like nature, natural, supernatural, and the Lonerganian use would require a, a change of meaning, sub substantially, I suppose, in a form of a... The, the nature, supernatural, can be an already out there now real to use a Lonerganian mm. expression, and it will become more critically analyzed. Let's put it in this context. First move, quantum mechanics. Take classical physics, observe how extrinsic to physics laws exist, we're describing them. Quantum mechanics realize the act of observation changes it. By analogy here, it's no longer extrinsic, intrinsic, as the interpersonal level is something of God himself intervening directly in nature and continuously cooperating with the natural. Or let's rephrase it, one, the act of creation itself of all natural laws is a supernatural act. The Big Bang was presumably a supernatural act, the creation of something from nothing. 
So the natural laws are one, a consequence of a supernatural act. Two, to deal with human beings, there's two approaches in evolution theory. I would say you have the Darwinian approach, probably Jacques Monet would be a great example, where you really do see somebody who's trying to be authentic and suggesting the greatness that man can achieve through evolution as a natural phenomena, probably the Ubermensch, the Nietzsche. Nietzsche. And on the other hand, you see John Paul II in this in his encyclical on work, or even earlier, Pope Pius XII, who fairly clearly talks about the creation of a human being is a direct intervention. Now let's call the direct intervention in scientific language maybe a second Big Bang. So on that, le on that level, you've already got a supernatural event operating on the, cooperating with the natural. And so in that sense, I, I, I don't know if I've misunderstood your paper, but I thought uh, this fifth level of the state of being in love was some way of trying to put together the natural with the supernatural in a coherent way without in any way being in conflict. But it is a paradigm shift. Because so th the old language will disappear and has to be integrated into a, a new level. Um, so in that sense, the word process, emergent probability as a natural phenomena, yes, you can have problems if you're strictly take natural law in a Thomas sense. I mean, at the end, is redemption purely a, a consequence of, we don't, need, we don't need redemption, I agree entirely, if emergent probability is purely a natural phenomena. However, if it's open to a supernatural phenomena, namely also the creation of human being directly by God who needs to be saved, then you do have something else. I don't know if I've understood correctly. Bene, grazie, invito a circoscrivere bene l'osservazione o la domanda. Grazie. Il terzo intervento. Hi, I'm René Mikalev. I teach um, fundamental moral theology here. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for your paper. I have a number of questions, so I'll try to just focus on, on some. Um, Certainly the debate, this debate has been considered by some theologians as one of the most important debates, if not the most important debate of the 20th century as regards dogmatic theology um, and also fundamental theology. So um, I'm interested to see how, you know, some of the main authors in this debate, like, uh, like Karl Rahner, would, would fit into this picture. Um, certainly De Lubac has, with his Blondelian uh, antecedents, a sense of uh, human nature or humanity transcending itself, because you know the idea of Blondel's action is that there is a there is a there is a self transcendence which can be seen within the human uh, action, and and he brings this to bear on the debate. Obviously, there are authors like like Runner who would call nature pure nature as a remainder concept, but uh, but still. Uh, would insist that there is a certain human autonomy in uh, when when they are speaking of you know um, a number of things as regards the world and moral moral issues. So so I think the the the, the greater debate is that the concept of nature. Obviously, De Lubac goes to criticize the problem of uh, of Jan Hus and uh, and the, the question of. Uh, of Cajetan's response to Hus as, as, the, as an interpretation of Thomas which modernizes Thomas and then gives us a concept of nature which is devoid of grace, which is a completely, con con completely naturalized, if I understand well, concept of nature. Obviously that brings us in moral theology, which is my field of expertise, to a problem because then we, we start to speak about, for example, the uh, naturalistic fallacy. If, if there is uh, a nature which doesn't have any teleo teleology and any, any, uh, any um, orientation towards God, then a lot of things which we say in moral theology don't make sense anymore. Um, so so uh, there again, how do we bring, however, a concept of nature, which is a very complex concept of nature in the tradition of Christianity, which is neither pantheistic, so where God is not completely inside, neither is it extrinsic to God, because it comes from God uh, but also uh, God is present through in the incarnation and yet not completely mixed with nature. So obviously uh, some approaches like neo-scholasticism obviously create all of these stepping stones, but there are jumps hidden by these stepping stones. Um, so I don't know if uh, the, today going back to that kind of 
hair splitting categorization of the levels uh, actually helps us to deal with these actual problems for moral theology and for conceptualizing uh, nature in a way that makes sense in ethics, for example, or uh, it, it, it gets us more disconnected from the current debates. So this is one, one like fundamental question. A second more concrete question is when we look at something like ethihilism. Um, would this work with the concept of sanctifying grace and the, the, the virtue of charity, which uh, Lonergan would be using in the 1940s, which is certainly linked to being baptized, being uh, part of an official church, uh, and being in the state of grace. Uh, so would, uh, how can we speak of experiences today after all of the debate on, on phenomenology and on, uh, uh, and on hermeneutics of human experience, you, going back to these categories which seem to impose a structure on the interpretation of experience, which may not be the, the structure which comes out of what people actually experience, and which is not maybe completely coherent with the pneumatology which comes out of the Vatican II. Bene, diamo senz'altro la parola al, al professor Rosenberg e, e poi vediamo non so il tempo che ci sarà o meno, ma stiamo un po' verso la fine. Magari sinteticamente in breve, breve lì. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, excellent, excellent questions, uh, difficult questions, challenging questions. So I'm very grateful uh, for them. The question on person and nature, I think it's a very good question. Uh, De Lubach often talks about concrete historical nature, and, uh, and that's one of the, the difficulties that many of the Thomists in this debate are raising to him, that, uh, that it's a very sloppy use of uh, the word nature, uh, because persons are concrete. Uh, nature uh, isn't concrete in that, in, in that sense. And so I think uh, it's an important uh, part of the debate. So I wanted to say that first, that uh, a part of uh, what I was trying to do in the book uh, is retrieve Lonergan's understanding. He says uh, we can talk about nature uh, in uh, a kind of, uh, you know, something, how, how does he put it? Nature as, um, I can't think of, in a classical sense, but we can also talk about nature as concretely operating. And so uh, it's difficult to see how that uh, parses out. So that's part of what I was just trying to, uh, to, to wrestle with. How, how do we talk about a kind of transcultural human nature dimension uh, of the human person while at the same time recognizing the human person as a historical being in time uh, sub, you know, subjectivity with a narrative and a history. So uh, I was playing with, uh, with that tension uh, in the paper. So I think uh, the Thomists are right to call De Lubac out uh, on uh, the kind of fluid uh, use, of, use of the term nature. And what I was trying to do was offer uh, an account of concrete subjectivity. All right, so want to get at the concreteness and the historical dimension of the person while also uh, affirming a kind of transcultural set of operations that uh, has persisted throughout time that, that human nature uh, possesses. So that's an inadequate answer, but I'll, I'll stick with that uh, for now. In, in terms of the, the, the paradigm shift, I guess um, in, a way, in a way it is a, a paradigm shift. Um, I don't have any uh, pretense to be you know, I'm going to go to the Gregorian and uh, launch a new paradigm for uh, theology. But I think, um, uh, to me, the challenge is, uh, Lonergan's challenge, uh, citing the, uh, uh, the 19th century encyclical, Leo XIII, what's the name? It's escaping me right now, where we uh, advocates Thomism and... Ah, Attorney Pace, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, to be uh, at home in the old and the new. And so part of what I see myself doing in a very limited way is uh, really taking, uh, say, the older distinctions of nature and supernature and the different distinctions of grace very seriously, very important uh, for, the, for the tradition. But then how might we uh, 
transpose or sublate those, and by sublate I mean sort of preserve those distinctions and elevate them or transpose them into uh, a newer context where uh, I'm trying to be more attentive in, in, in at least an initial way to, uh, to you know, what science, scientists, some of, the, some of the currents of science and how science uh, speaks of nature. And uh, your point about Darwinian and then John Paul II approach, uh, yeah, I don't begin to touch that here. And I think the more we get into the weeds on that question of nature, uh, those questions will have to be uh, parsed out further. But I think there is a kind of paradigm shift that, uh, that takes into account uh, the development that we find in phenomenology on, on, on uh, yeah, you say the interpersonal or the intersubjective, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, to sort of transpose these terms into a, a more interpersonal, intersubjective approach uh, that um, at least I think has bore fr borne fruit uh, in philosophical and theological uh, thinking, the kind of interpersonal, relational uh, dimension of uh, human beings in relation to uh, God. And that's why looking at somebody like Therese or Eddie um, uh, I think is helpful. Um, I think uh, the point uh, about imposing some of these, this theoretical frame on, uh, on Eddie. I really, I mean, to be honest with you, I've really wrestled with that. Um, and some have suggested that uh, she didn't understand herself uh, according to that, you know, kind of operating according uh, to that language. And uh, to impose that uh, is to get in pretty, um, uh, I don't know what the right word is, um, difficult territory uh, to make those claims. And so uh, I would say that uh, what I was trying to do, well, maybe it didn't seem modest, but a, a kind of just speculation uh, in light of, say, the pontificate of John Paul II and Benedict uh, about uh, you know, the, the Holy Spirit working uh, outside of the ecclesial milieu. And uh, as best as I can, uh, and I started working on Eddie Hillison before I found the Benedict uh, homily where he talks about her. And I think, wow, he's, think, he's thinking along similar lines right here of discerning the, the work of the Spirit in Hill, Hillison. So it's a kind of speculation about uh, the work of God in history. And I am, uh, I, I am a little uh, kind of aware that it's, it's maybe much easier to think about these things with Therese. Uh, but... Uh, but nevertheless, uh, with, with even my uneasiness, the baptism question, uh, uh, it, it seemed plausible from a Catholic perspective to try to discern the work of God in a life like Eddie. Uh, and so I, I went forth and, and did so, understanding that uh, your, your really good and challenging point non so se c'è spazio per un'ultimissima domanda, se c'è, o altrimenti possiamo avviarci verso la, la conclusione. Ma certamente, ecco, forse dal fondo arriva un'ultima domanda. È una domanda a terra terra, diciamo, però siccome mi sono domandata se, se Dio è gioia, allora... Se, siccome eh, se si vive in questo mondo in tante difficoltà, eccetera, allora dobbiamo considerare che, che ci sia una, una gioia naturale oppure dobbiamo considerare che, che Dio essendo gioia e, e ci comunica attraverso il suo spirito, eh, lo spirito di Cristo, diciamo così, nel mondo che va al di là dei de, 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 de confini eh, eh, visibili, eh, considerare che quando si parla di gioia eh, nel mondo, eh, nelle persone, eh, si parla eh, insomma, intrinsecamente delle, della gioia che, si dà, che, che lo Spirito Santo de, diffonde nel mondo. Quindi, um, thank you. Uh, uh, how do we find joy uh, in a world where uh, that doesn't encourage it? I will just leave you with one image from I'll wait till she gets her headphones. I, I will leave you with one image uh, from Eddie Hillison, and that is uh, she was in Amsterdam laying uh, in her room in the middle of the afternoon, and she was listening to Bach, and bombs were going off uh, in the background. And I don't have the, the, her reflection memorized right now, but she talks about uh, finding joy in the beauty 
uh, of the music and thanks God for uh, the beauty that Bach uh, has given her in the midst of knowing that a bomb might fall uh, on her apartment in any moment. So for me, it's turning to, and again, I probably should have clarified, she's obviously not a saint in the sense of canon, canonization or anything like that, but turning to uh, holy people or the people in whom we, we discern holiness for ways uh, to see God at work in their lives uh, and the ability to have the gift of joy uh, that the Holy Spirit gives even in the midst of uh, horrendous circumstances such as Eddie's. Uh, I don't pretend to say that's easy or, or anything like that, but for me, that's what would give me, sort of open up my imagination, uh, an example like that of finding joy in the midst of really uh, horrendous and difficult circumstances. Bene, grazie. Abbiamo esaurito ormai tutto il tempo. Ringrazio particolarmente il professor Rosenberg. Certamente dopo i lavori eh, di oggi pomeriggio non potremo più considerare il naturale o il soprannaturale come semplici concetti distinti. Non sono soltanto distinti, li distinguiamo naturalmente, ma alla luce anche delle proposte che ci sono state fatte li vediamo effettivamente interagenti anche in, quella, in quell'ottica del pensiero di Bernard Lonergan in ordine a quel desiderio naturale di vedere Dio in cui in quel naturale però era già anche presente il soprannaturale. Grazie a quanti sono convenuti e eh, ci hanno dato la possibilità effettivamente di eh, completare ulteriormente con gli interventi anche quanto era stato esposto. Grazie a tutti, buona serata. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.